nothing stopped the airlift. Planes were lost, and courageous men gave their lives. But the supply of the construction work went on. I remember it was the military-type um, uh, aircraft, DC plane, and, uh, and it ran out of fuel. So with all the equipment on, on board, it landed on the ice, just short of Churchill at the time. In 1955, I was working in a machine shop. I'm still working in the machine shop. But at that time, the machine shop was down way in the, where the slip was. Well, it's just like everybody was talking about it at work that there was a, a DC-4 crash in the, on the ice, made by Douglas. And it was uh, four engines, and it, it, it wasn't like the DC-3, you know, it had a tail on it and sat down. This one sat up, eh? And I, all I know that, that uh, Johnny Voise and, uh, and his bunch went out there and uh, they were they're involved in that. good time up there when 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 he wasn't away for trapping like we'd go walking on the tundra and go fishing and, and stuff like that Johnny Boise oh yes I know knew him very very good um, as a kid I remember I used to see him all the time like we lived down the flats and uh, like we had to walk back and forth to town whatever and I remember running him running into him all the time he was always out uh, checking his nets or uh, hunting geese but he was just happy to be out in the land eh? And, but that's what I remember about Johnny Boise. I remember going on the boat and, and going down and uh, they bring in whales and lots of different memories I have of him and my dad and, and stuff eh? and, but it seems like they were always working like they were always working. As time went on, my Aunt Frances married my Uncle John. And I think actually all the girls were interested in Uncle John. I, I was working in the hospital when the, as a nurse. I was on a, a night, night duty when uh, there's, I went out to see uh, there was somebody walking around in the hallway and I, I says to him, uh, are you going to be visiting somebody? And he says, no, I'm looking for uh, somebody by the name of Francis. And uh, I said, I am, I'm Francis. And he said to me, uh, your dad told me if I go to the park to go and see you and, and take me out for lunch or something. <laughs> That's how I met him. We got married in July 1942 in Nepal, in the Anglican Church. Yeah. No, oh, John was a very nice man. Yeah, 100%. But he's like, come on, I know. Don't like talking. <laughs> you know, he was, he was very quiet. He was humble. He was proud. And he wasn't one to brag about his accomplishments. And I never used to brag about what he did. And, yeah, and, that, that and that's why we would like to hear what he did sometime, but he never used to tell us eh, what the... You know, other people would say, oh, Johnny did this or whatever, but he would never come home and say, you know, I got the biggest whale today. You know, that was just the type of guy he was. And Johnny he was a real master at canoeing in that ocean, I'll tell you. I was pretty worried out there at times, but uh, when I look back at Johnny and he had a grin on his face, I knew we were all right. 
I they, don't know how many of these guys could swim, but I don't think many of them could. Not very and, good. <laughs> and and I never saw a life preserver. Or, no. No. They, they were absolutely fearless. Yeah. You see Johnny go out with his uh, canoe there to set a whale net, and you'd see them on top of the wave, and then they'd vanish. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he'd be on top yeah. with a, what, 22-foot canoe out on Hudson Bay. I couldn't believe it. This kayak was from Greenland, and uh, it was brought here for a film called Savage Innocence, and Anthony Quinn was starring in the film, and you could see with the cockpit that it's quite shallow, and he uh, uh, couldn't fit in it, and he had no kayaking abilities, so Johnny Voicey, a local trapper, uh, did all the shots in the river that, was, uh, that they used in the film. I know one time they asked me Quinn been come uh, like they used to bring their meal at, uh, down uh, on on the ice and uh, asked me Quinn didn't come or oh, he didn't come right away so dad ate his chicken so <laughs> Anthony Quinn got mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> he got mad dad because he, he ate his chicken. <laughs> Everybody knew John. A real nice guy to be around, happy guy, a good guy, a great guy to work with because he was never upset. Nothing seemed to bother him. Uh, he, uh, he was involved in that plane thing too, I'm sure. Actually, I didn't really, actually, I didn't know about that till, you know, till my husband was called to go and help uh, pull that that plane in, there were four canoes that they had used to pull, and there was Kid Lapik and Tutu and my husband and, and somebody else, I think, yeah. Just on little stories that I get from friends uh, from where we live now in Uwit, they were telling me stories about how my father used to give their parents or uh, family uh, no, just a helping hand in, in anything. Pierre Tutu's son, Batiste, was certainly there. And the remarkable thing is, in retrospect, that uh, Batiste was probably only five or six years older than I was. I'm not entirely sure, but I know he wasn't that much older than I was. But even at 16 or 17, he was already an accomplished uh, boat person and had all the confidence in the world. It was the spring break and they wanted me to go. It was Johnny Voicey, Norman Ford Jr., Peter Illnick, one of my uncles, and uh, the lab from Aguirre. They wanted to get somebody out there to uh, to bring it in uh, with the boat, and uh, Dad had a boat. Uh, we used uh, a Peter Hit, they call it Peter Hit or a long liner, the inboard. 42 footer. I remember, yes, like growing up as a kid, there was always Peterheads in Churchill, like coming from north, eh? And uh, that was the only way for years and years that uh, uh, anybody up north got any uh, products, eh? So now they got the NTCL barge, which you know, can get to haul all, anything now. So Peterheads are a uh, thing in the past. Those old ones are, you see a lot of them up north, they're just on a, like on a beach day and just drying out. And nobody's running them anymore and they're just all gonna blow away in the wind one of these days. My dad, Pierre Tutu, Pierre Kudluk Tutu. Uh, Jordan Tutu, the hockey player, he's named after, like, his name's Kudluk, named after my dad, his grandfather. Um, uh, and my dad, I remember he, he was a jack of all trades. You give him a, a, a puzzle or something to do, he'd figure it out, just like those Rubik's Cubes, eh? That way of thinking was a big part, like, of being up north, like, you had to. Like, if you couldn't think, three-dimensional or whatever, you, you know, you, you would have a hard, hard time. It wasn't a game, like, you know, you didn't go out there and just pretend to learn how to 
live, you had to know that you were going to go over there and you're going to go get a polar bear or a seal or a walrus or something. You know what you were going after, eh? And it was a way, different way of life. Uh, He's 76, 77 now, eh? I'm his oldest son, and I was around when that happened there. And uh, they had to get everything off from the plane over to Churchill. Because when they got on the plane, on the helicopter to head over to the crash site there, he, he kind of lost it, eh? Because he never flown before in his life, and I guess he's scared of heights. <laughs> We're out by Chopper, by Fort Churchill area. Uh, there was a pilot, and they could only take two people, so we were going up by back and forth. It was It was more or less said that it was just a valuable aircraft that they had to salvage, and and uh, since then, well, I've I've heard different uh, stories of, of why they did this, and and perhaps that it was a very secret aircraft, but. Um, not being able to see inside or, or go inside, I have no knowledge of exactly what it was doing. You know, like find somebody, somebody that had a peak in this thing. You know, Batiste Tutu, he definitely had a peak in that plane. You know, and a damn good one. And, you know, like find out from him. What what does he think of this? You know, and he'll remember it. I mean, that guy's sharp. Uh, yeah, there was nothing. Everything was taken out. I guess they were going in and out there with the uh, helicopter and uh, I guess they got the crew out. There was all kinds of instruments there. That's why they had to pick it up because uh, the uh, it was top secret equipment they had to get. Howard Hunt presents a, a whole bunch of problems because uh, there was a, a person that was one of the uh, probably the, one of the charter uh, members of the CIA. Here he is in Churchill for this uh, crash landing on uh, Hudson Bay Ice. in the uh, Life magazine at uh, Churchill, Manitoba in 1955. As yeah. we're growing up, like Dad talking about that, bringing in the plane. Oh, yeah. He never really talked about he it. He never used to tell us no. nothing. No. Maybe he was a spy. Spy? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was a spy. <laughs> 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 you got you got a boat, you got a motor, and you got lots of ice, you know, and it's sitting on top of the ice. And if we have to, maybe we can just put some rubber tires or something under the wings to keep it floating, eh? Uh, I guess towing it there from with an ice pack there, heading over to Churchill, and then they put uh, big uh, flotation devices on it so that it doesn't sink. You know, inside there we had a uh, one of those big rubber wraps inside, blew blew it up for buoyancy, I guess. 